Hello YouTube, this is uh, Eric Lightwolf on the Lightwolf Shamanic Healing Channel. Um, I know that there's not very much contrast or lighting or whatever, you know, the lighting could be better in this video, but I don't have the equipment to do that at this time. And Spirit spoke to me and said, getting this recording out in any way is better than procrastinating and not getting it out at all. So in that case, I am going to hope that it's recording audio just fine. And it is 11, I'm sorry, it's on November 15th, 2020. It is Sunday at 6.43 a.m. Central Time. I'm broadcasting from Alabama. And this isn't a live video, uh, so you'll probably see it sometime in the next hour or so, or further down the line. But God gave me a message, and I'm here to share it with you today. This is uh, pursuant, or applicable, I should say, to the uh, 2020 presidential election. One of the things... That God said, well, let me just let me just put it like this. First, first let's let's say a prayer <clears throat> before we enter this session. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for surrounding us with love and light, protecting us and keeping us safe, and guiding us on our path for our highest good. Protect our president, Donald J. Trump, our mayor, David Hayes our pastor, James Curtis Harvey Sr., our friends and family, and a special prayer of protection for Hunter Biden, that he may realize the error of his ways, that he may seek forgiveness, that he may want to truly change just as the persecutor Paul did, who murdered the Jews and then became Christ's greatest advocate for the, his word, for love. We pray for, we pray for a, a tremendous transformation in Hunter Biden, an honest transformation, one based in love and compassion. And we pray that he starts by forgiving himself and that he seeks your word and your guidance. Also, Help us to, or bless us as we go about our day, and help us to be a blessing to others. Thank you, we love you, and so it is. Blessed be. Amen. Okay. And some of you, you can say amen if you're of the Christian persuasion, or you can say blessed be, and either way, it means the same thing. Okay. So. I wrote this down so that I could get it done kind of faster without meandering. So here we go. God's Spirit Jesus spoke to me when I was meditating this morning and said to tell everyone that as Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and brought down the corrupt city with the blowing of horns, so believers should pick up and blow a horn Tuesday, November 17th at exactly 2.10 p.m. Central Time. So... On the East Coast, I think that would be 3.10 p.m. And uh, West Coast, it would be two hours earlier. So it would be 12.10 p.m., so basically 10 minutes after noon. And then it would be 1.10 p.m. Mountain, mountain time, if I'm correct. If I'm correct. You should double-check in your own area. But 2.10 p.m. Central Time. Everyone around the world who believes in freedom should do this, but especially freedom-loving Americans. For freedom from tyranny and freedom to love is Jesus' message in a nutshell. A ram's horn or shofar is preferred, but any horn you have will be better than nothing. Even to a simple paper noisemaker used to celebrate the new year, or even a harmonica or a kazoo, can you make a sound like a ram's horn come from your throat? 
Two weeks ago, I prayed to God and asked, what did he want me to do regarding the, this election mess? He only replied one word, blow. At the time, it didn't make much sense. But later that night, I watched a YouTube video with the two Kims, and they rocked a song that almost sounded like psychedelic heavy metal. This was on uh, Sid Roth. I think his name is Sid Roth. He's a, a prophet. Uh, Sid Roth's YouTube channel. Anyway, a psychedelic heavy, heavy metal. It was somewhat of a dirge, but at the same time, an uplifting hymn. Like the old Negro spiritual, follow the drinking gourd. If you've never heard it, uh, some of the verses are, or, or let's say the one I remember the most, because we learned this in second grade, believe it or not. For the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom if you follow the drinking gourd. Yeah, look it up. It's a pretty interesting song. It's all about the drinking gourd is the uh, Big Dipper. And it's all about following the North Star to get to Canada on the Underground Railroad uh, back during the slavery times of the 1800s. Okay, so, well, wouldn't you know it, God is good. At a certain point, he said, the one of the Kims, the, the male Kim, because it's a, a man and a woman, he told the audience, he said, God wants you to blow. That's when I knew it was a sign. He picked up a shofar and began to blow. I felt the spirit move within me, and though I had no horn, I lifted my arms to heaven at a 33 degree angle and began to mimic the sound of the shofar with my voice. So it was something like this. Uh... Something like that. Uh, sort of like a low E chord. <clears throat> Look up some YouTube videos on the sound of a shofar and do your best to mimic it. A similar sound is heard in Tibetan throat singing. Now I know the phrase is Mongolian throat singing, so I asked Spirit, don't you mean Mongolian? And he said, no, Tibetan. So maybe there's something called Tibetan throat singing, or maybe what we call Mongolian throat singing is actually Tibetan throat singing. I'm not sure what the distinction is there. I asked God if it was sinning to speak to animal spirits, ascended masters, etc. He replied that it is not a sin. He said, These spirits are my kinsmen, saith the Lord, whom I have put here for a purpose, just as I put you here for a purpose. You may call on them for help, just as others should be able to call on you for help. There is no sin in this. Then Quan Yin stepped forward a few times, a little bashfully. So like she would step forward, like she was going to say something, and then I'd see her step back. And then she'd wait a few seconds and do the same routine. And so after three times, uh, after the third time of her saying nothing, I asked her to speak her mind. She told me that I should remember the oceans. Remember the oceans. And I'm like... What the heck? What's that got to do with anything? What am I supposed to remember about the oceans? And I said, can you clarify for me? And when I asked for clarification, because that made absolutely no sense, uh, she said, um, you must figure that out for yourself. Now, just for some background, Kuan Yin has been coming to me in the past, uh, along with other animal spirits, and occasionally... Lou of the Celtic persuasion, etc. And she usually says something about purify. She's she's for me, she's a symbol of, of purification. And she represents that energy which wants that part of God that wants me here to help purify the world. Not purify as in murder people 
but purify as in transform uh, a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, let us say. So, you know, I still don't know what she's talking about, but like she said, it's for me to figure out, so I'm sure God will give me signs. And this, I wrote this down when I was preparing for this video. Kuan Yin has come to me in the past, instructing me to help purify the unclean, sanctify polluted areas, and help clean up spilled blood. So she may be talking about toxic waste or floating plastic, but I'm not getting... I'm not feeling like that's exactly it. And then in order that I would not forget these things, that was it. I said, did anybody else have anything they wanted to say in the spirit council? And nobody, nobody, nope. That's it. That's what they, <laughs> somebody said, that's it. And uh, so then I said, okay. Thank you for your time. I love you and I release you. And now I release you doesn't mean like I was holding them hostage or anything, but it's the same thing you do when you hang up the phone. You're releasing the person on the other end so that they can go about their business and possibly call others or uh, be able to receive others call if they need to. But that may be too technical and, and, and a not quite exactly a perfect analogy, but that's what I'm getting at. It's it's you're just letting somebody, thanking somebody and letting them go. Like when I call my neighbor Raymond and say, hey, Raymond, I got a question. And then Raymond answers the question. I say, thank you so much, Raymond. And then I say, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye, buddy. And then I hang up the phone. That's, that's what it is when you say I release you in this case. Okay. So that's the video, uh, that's the vision part of the video. Now I want to share with you the Bible study part of the video. And here's why. Isaiah, I've been seeing quotes from the book of Isaiah everywhere. And I've been feeling drawn to Isaiah. And yesterday, yesterday? No, two days ago, the day before yesterday, which would have been Friday. I Friday the 13th, I love I love Friday the 13th. I've never felt it was a scary, haunted, uh, bad day. I've never felt it was an unlucky day. When I heard that, I was like, I don't know, second grade? And I was like, I think Friday the 13th is probably a good day. I think everybody else is probably just deceived. And let me tell you what, maybe as positive thinking, maybe I convinced myself of that and the law of attraction made it so but whatever the mechanism Friday the 13th has always been a great day for me almost like a holiday um anyway so it was Friday the 13th it was in the morning I had just gotten up I was doing ablutions and <laughs> I said to Jesus I said okay Jesus Help me find the part of Isaiah that you want me to read right now. I turn my book, my Bible, and yeah, just so you can see, this is because as if you know my story, I used to be an atheist, and this was one of my proudest possessions, the Skeptic's Annotated Bible. It's the King James Bible, but then the commentary is commentary that's critical of what seems to be, oh, what would you call it? Um, inconsistencies, discrepancies, and what some would say are out and out deceptions and lies. So when I was an atheist, I loved this book. Although I didn't love it as much as I thought I was going to, but in any case, I still love the binding. And it is the Bible. So, so if you see me refer to this, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. And if you're an atheist and you're watching this right now, and you don't have this book, I would encourage you to get this book. Because you will learn the Bible. <laughs> okay, here we go. So what I was saying was, before I meandered off, I asked Jesus to show me, to lead me to the part of Isaiah that he wanted me to read first. I open the book, 
and it went right here to Joshua. I didn't want to read Joshua. I wasn't intending on reading Joshua. Joshua wasn't even on my mind. I didn't have, wasn't I was trying to read Isaiah. But Jesus led me to Joshua. So I started reading. And he had me read nine verses. The first nine verses. And right now I will share these verses with you. Starting so Joshua 1, 1 to 9. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan thou, and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given, that have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses. So what he's saying is, I told Moses this, and I'm telling you this also. Every place that you walk with your feet, that land is yours. Uh, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. So I think this passage, or let me rephrase this, Holy Spirit, is showing me that this passage has often and understandably been mistranslated. I'll read it again. This is uh, Joshua 1, uh, verse 5, the second part, where he says, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Okay. In many instances, most leaders of churches and Christian thought tend to interpret that as as I was in other words I was with Moses okay if you say I was with Bob that means that you were side by side you were together you were in an experience doing something together but I don't believe yeah in my opinion based on what spirit is showing me that's not what it means here. That's not what they're saying. What he's saying is the way I was with Moses, the, the, you know, like the way I dealt with Moses, how I acted, how I treated him is how I will deal with you, how I will treat you. I will not, I told Moses I wouldn't fail him nor forsake him and I'm not going to fail or forsake you. And I believe, I could be wrong, do your own research, but I believe that in this case, forsake means forget. I won't forget about you. I won't forget the promise that I made to you. If you're in trouble, I won't, uh, I won't not respond. You know, I'll always be there for you, essentially. Okay, we continue with verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people... Shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them? Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Now, this is code in a way. In the ancient times, there was this concept of walking the middle path. And you, you've probably heard that if you've heard any Buddhist teachings at all. But Jesus taught this also. Uh, doing everything in moderation is something that is spoken of often today. You know, especially people who overeat or gamble or anything like that. Uh, uh, everything in moderation, even moderation. 
Moderation is another way of saying walking the middle path. But what really struck me about this was we're in the middle of a, an election right now and it's disputed whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump is the winner. The news is falsely claiming that <laughs> Joe Biden is the winner. Those who have been paying attention, who have the eyes to see, and whose heart is open, and who have been able to put aside their ego, and put that ego person aside, and let God speak to them so that their heart can understand, will realize that Trump is God's chosen one. And even if they don't personally like Trump, that he's the one God has chosen. He's not a perfect man, and who among us is? Jesus said, let him who is perfect, who has never sinned, cast the first stone. <laughs> Have you never sinned? Are you perfect? So, he says, and this is verse 7, by the way. He says, Turn not from it. So what he's talking about is the law, as Moses gave. And there's a debate over this. There's lots of debate over this. But I believe, myself, from my own research and study and what God has shown me, that the law of Moses was given to those at a time who were wrapped up in being away from God. I don't know how to explain it. Same things you're seeing right now, the gambling, the adultery, the, the constant sinning. It, it's just basically um, I, I don't really want to say that, but I'm seeing the words filth and adoration of idols. And that's not what it's about. God's not saying you can't have a statue of something. You can't have a Star Wars action figure or a Barbie collector doll or uh, a trophy of the time you won a karate tournament. You know, That's not what God's saying with idolatry. What he's talking about specifically is worshiping, is working for something that is not God. Working for the ends and working toward the ends of an entity, an idea, a thought, a movement, or even a person who is not God. That's putting your trust in a false God. So, for instance, If you put your trust in science, science in your case, if you're not able to listen to reason and you believe that militant scientists, as opposed to the rational scientists, uh, are, Lord help me with the words are the end-all, be-all in your life, then you are putting them before God. Why is this important? Because God made everything. God made the spirit that is you. You are not a body with a spirit. You are a spirit who is inhabiting a body. Otherwise, sometimes called a DNA skin suit in your life right now. When you die, your spirit will move on. It can never die. It can never be destroyed. We know the laws of entropy and energy. Energy can never be created or destroyed. Why? Because all energy comes from God. All energy is a part of God and is connected to God. But while we are here on earth, 
our spirits are deliberately disconnected from God so that we can do our own experiments in love, I guess. It's interesting. I don't, I don't want to make this video too long, but let me just point this part out at the end of verse 7. He says, turn not from it, again, the law, to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So, so what that said to me, see, God inspired people to write the books that were compiled into becoming the Bible, right? At the time they were written, they weren't the Bible. They were just somebody's letters or somebody's poems, you know. God has told me that right now, and, and many... Well, my pastor personally doesn't believe it. But neither did those who thought Jesus was blaspheming against the Jewish law in the Jewish Bible, what we call the Old Testament. So it's understandable, and we, we forgive them for their, their ignorance, for their not knowing. Um, for they are doing the best that they believe uh, what is right. But Spirit has shown me that right now he is writing, God is writing the Third Testament. I don't know what that means. It could be a thousand years down the line. People will be, some of our, those who are working for God right now, some of our writings, some of our songs, poems, uh, anecdotes, stories, testimonies, will be in a third Bible that people in a thousand years from now will be reading. I just find that fascinating to know that you are here at such a time as this and have been chosen to be a part of this history that God is writing. So he says, follow his law. Okay. The law, when Jesus came, it was said that well, there was debate after Jesus died among the leaders, among his followers, those who were highest up, who were chosen to, to lead what would become the church. The followers of Jesus um, were talking about Paul, Peter, and James, the brother of Jesus, and probably others, but those are the ones that are on my mind at the moment. Um, there was debate over whether whether Gentiles should be required to be circumcised, etc. And Paul brought up the point that Gentiles have never known Jewish law. They've never known the law of Moses. They've ha they have lived by different laws. So it would be unfair to subscript them to the laws of Moses when they never were part of what caused God to force the laws that became known as the laws of Moses, but were God's laws upon the Jewish people. Hope that made sense. <laughs> um, yes. So in the end, it was determined and it was agreed unanimously after much debate that the Gentiles should not be held to the same standard of Moses' law that the Jews would still be held to. Why is this? At the time, I mean, you can't just change everything all at once, right? If I said, well, let's put it this way. If Jesus came again right now, And he was recognized as Jesus, even though he was recognized as Jesus and his followers were here. And Jesus said, 
the end of the world has come many times and every time there has been enough love in the world to prevent it. So what you see in Revelations is not something to come, it's something that has already happened. Many people who are followers and believers would not be able to accept that. And we have to understand that because they have a legalistic mindset. There are many Christians today, many Christians, many pastors that have a legalistic mindset. Not the laws of Moses, but even the loving laws and teachings of Jesus and what they believe was taught by John the, the, uh, John, the, John the Revelator in the book of Revelations and what was spoken of in Acts and Paul's letters. They're not able to see it as lessons, as models, as philosophy on how to live a good life uh, that was brought directly from a supernatural God. Instead, they see it as written in stone, even though they're not acknowledging that there are multiple interpretations. Now, my pastor says there's, there's only one interpretation and multiple applications. I agree that there's multiple applications. That's why the Bible is so important. But I disagree that there's only one interpretation. It only takes somebody who understands interpretation to realize how incorrect that is. But I'll move on. If you want me to make a video, we can, we can discuss what's involved in interpretation, uh, biblical historiology, textual criticism, and uh, different things like that. Uh, apologis apologism, apologis, um, yes. Even the early church fathers knew this. So, continuing on. This is all just to say that we are not bound on the laws of Moses today. Jesus, when he shed his blood on the cross and sacrificed for all of us, his blood covers anyone who comes to him and says, I accept your sacrifice, I believe your teachings, and I will do my best to follow your ways. Often that's simplified to, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now, others will debate me. Others will, and there, this has been a debate that's been going on since, again, the early church fathers, the first century. Shortly after Jesus died, within decades, they were arguing about whether Jesus abolished the law of Moses or not. All I can tell you is my opinion. If I'm not deceived by a lying spirit, I believe that Jesus, in opposition to what many pastors and preachers preach, uh, I believe that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross wiped all our sins away. Everyone who would accept him as their Lord and Savior. You can't have two masters. So in other words, you can't, they use the example of, you know, you can't have money and God both be your masters. That doesn't mean you can't use money. That just means it can't be your highest goal. Your highest goal must be obeying and, and pleasing God. Why? Because God is not a harsh taskmaster in the sense that he wants you to fail. God is here to help make you a hero of your own story. That's it in a nutshell, people. God wants to make you the hero of your own story. And if you just sit around moaning and complaining, and then you pray every once in a while, and you don't have a personal relationship with God, you're not thanking him for everything in your life, all you're doing is being a victim of your own making. God wants you to be a hero of your own story. Now, I, I urge you to not believe anything I say 
but trust in your own spiritual guidance. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, because this is just my opinion and my interpretation of my experience. Others would say, my truth, but there is only one truth, the truth of God, the truth of the universe, the truth of he who made all. Everything else is aspects of truth, experiences of truth, and interpretation of truth. So, in this time of political division, I leave you once again with the last half of verse 7. Turn not from it, from the law of God, which is love one another. Be compassionate to everyone. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is everyone. Not just the person who lives next to you. Not just the person who's in the same club and the beliefs as you. Even those who, as Jesus said, spitefully use you. Even those who persecute you. Love them as yourself. Give them the benefit of the doubt. See them as somebody who's hurting. Hurt people hurt. You ever heard that phrase? Hurt people hurt. Those who are hurting people the most are people who have been hurt often in childhood. Can you show them some compassion? Can you do as Jesus did? What would Jesus do if he was encountered with a bully or somebody who was screaming and accusing and making false accusations. I believe he would try to find out why they're hurting so much. Who hurt them? And what is the nature of the pain that's driving them to hurt others? Okay. I'm never going to get over this. Let's, let's finish this up. This, and listen, the right hand or the left is what I keep trying to read to you. Turn not from it, from the law of God, not the law of Moses. At the time, the law of Moses was the closest thing that the Hebrews had. Otherwise, false prophets and false teachers would say you could do whatever you wanted. But the law, when Jesus came after he died and was risen, Paul said, the law of God is written on the hearts of Gentiles. So what that means is, take atheists for instance. Atheists who aren't believers in Jesus can do the right thing, can be obeying the Ten Commandments even though they don't know it. Because the law of God is written on the hearts of the righteous, of those who haven't lost their connection to compassion. It's interesting. But that's a video for another time, let's say. Okay. This is so important, I'm going to read it one more time. Joshua 1, verse 7. You're going to get tired of hearing it. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So what that's saying to me in this time of political turmoil, where our country can go one way or another, can go God's way or it can go the other way, uh, is the left isn't right, isn't correct. If you go um, um, far, far left, right? so what they call far left, which means extremists on the left, 
I know these words have, have gotten uh, emotionally charged by people after certain goals, whatever, in the last uh, couple of decades, actually, but definitely the last four or five years. But far left, okay? Far right. Look those up and find out what those mean. But don't look up look it up on the internet. Find a book from 10, 15 years ago and find out the definition of far left and far right. That's what this is, verse is speaking to me. You need to maintain the middle ground. In other words, what politically is called a centrist. And often centrists are vilified as fence sitters. Now there's a difference between a sycophant, which is somebody who goes whatever way the wind blows. If the left side is winning, then they'll they'll go with the left side. If the right side is winning, they'll go with the right side, etc. There's a difference between a sycophant and somebody who walks the middle ground, a centrist. Somebody who walks the middle ground, a centrist, is somebody who doesn't align themselves to one side or another, but listens fairly to both sides, actually to all sides, because there's not just two sides to any story. Listens to all sides, takes in all the information, and then uses their own uh, learning, background, understanding, intuition to chew it over and decide what makes sense to them. This is actually the, the nature of a judge. And we are all judges in our own right if we are in our authentic spiritual natures. But more often than not, we are polluted by what's going on in the world. So let's continue on with the last two verses then. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not be, depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So this is verse 8. What I think is really interesting about this is, he says, the book of the law, the Ten Commandments, in other words, of Moses, shall not depart out of thy mouth. He didn't say out of thy mind or out of thy heart. He says out of thy mouth. That means you're going to keep speaking this and speaking this and speaking this and people are going to get so tired of hearing it because you're going to speak it so much. And you're going to repeat it so much. You're going to know it. Everybody's going to know it around you. Nobody's going to be able to forget it because I don't want my people to stray the way they did before and forget my law, which is simply be kind to others. Stop trying to misuse each other. Thus saith the Lord. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So he said that about three or four times to Joshua in this section. And he said, look, I told you I'm not going to leave you. I'm with you. I'm giving you this commission, this commandment, and this power. If you do this, you will be successful because I am with you. So I heard a pastor, a couple preachers actually, I listened to a lot of uh, pastors from other churches I'd never even be able to go to because they're spread around the world and around the United States. Um, I listened to them on YouTube, and one of them yesterday, I, I heard him say something really interesting. He said um, about the word meditate. He said in, in the Hebrew word that was used for meditate, the translation was a description of, of what the Jews do at the wailing wall, essentially. They sort of mumble and groan while rocking back and forth and mm, ch 
chewing, basically what he said was ruminating and chewing on an issue, right? So me to meditate on something, to meditate on the word, if you were to meditate right now on what I just read you about Joshua, the first thing I would recommend is that you go grab your own Bible and read those verses for yourself so you know that what I'm saying is true, that I'm not just making something up. Then after you read those verses, if you are to meditate in the way that he instructed the Jews of Joshua's time, it would be you sit there and you think about it. Now, excuse me, in, in yogic traditions and stuff, we are taught that meditation means to let, and Buddhist, uh, to clear your mind of all things. That's not what we're talking about here. We're actually talking about filling your mind with the Word of God and then Mm. This is what I mean shown. Something like this. My best guess on the moaning and groaning that's supposed to, to happen is as you have a revelation and you kind of go, hmm, that could have been that could have been what they're characterizing as moaning. But anyway, I'm going to leave you with that. This is the end of the video. Thank you for joining us. I pray that you have a beautiful and blessed day. And if you go to church today, remember uh, what, what was spoken here because these aren't the words of Eric. These are the words of Eric as inspired by God. Oh, how can you be blessed by God today? How can you be a blessing to others? That's the question I leave you with. Go ahead and leave a, a comment below and let me know how you think you can be a blessing. How is God changing your life? Has God made you a blessing in somebody else's life? Have you been a turd to people recently? Yeah, I said it. Have you been a turd? Have you been a real turd ball to people? Is God doing a scrooge on you? Is God touching your heart through this video and saying you need to come back to Jesus and start showing others the love that Jesus showed us when he died for us, not even knowing us? Well, let's close with a prayer. Thank you, Jesus for being here with us. We know not why you brought Jim and Sam and Shaniqua and Johnny and Big Johnny and Little Johnny and everybody else who's watching today. We don't know why you brought them to watch this video and we don't know what role you causing me to make this video plays in the grander scheme. All we know is that if it were not meant to be, it would not have happened and that somebody out there is seeking this message today and that you have caused me to make this video and I have honored you and obeyed that this message can get out. I thank you for being a loving God, a loving leader, a loving father, and for helping to show us the way, for sacrificing everything to show us how to continuously be compassionate and how to continuously display the love of God to others and how to teach others and to multiply your teachings among the world. If anybody who's listening to this doesn't know, doesn't know Jesus, listen to my voice right now. Listen to this prayer and speak it in your heart. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to show us the way to live a better life and to be kind to others and to help make the world a better place. I believe that God is love 
and that though bad things happen, they all happen for a reason. And that God wants to make me the hero in my own story. And that I'm tired of being a victim. I'm tired of acting like a victim. I'm tired of whining and complaining. I'm tired of accusing others of causing my life misery. I'm ready to let you lead my life and to surrender everything to you. Lord, maybe I was an atheist. Maybe I was a Satanist. Maybe I was a Wiccan. Nothing says that I can't hold on to my understanding that I have in my soul, that God is all around us, that there are nature spirits, that there are creatures that we can't see that are in other dimensions and other time spaces. Because Lord, you create it all and everything is possible with you. I release the witchcraft of the false prophets who have hypnotized me into believing everything the news says, everything that those who are your enemies and everything that the politicians say and everything that those who would sacrifice the children to Baal are trying to convince Christians of. Maybe you're not a Christian and you're hearing this message for the first time. You're hearing about Jesus and his love and God and the Bible and you've, you've heard of it, but you've never been there. Today, I'm hoping that I've helped you to come here, to come to Jesus, to come to the Bible, to come to a place that will give you a starting point for your own transformation. If you accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then, and that's all there is to it. If you say it with an honest and true heart, the Holy Spirit will now come into you and help guide you. If you've ever been saved in your life, the Holy Spirit's been with you this whole time. And he's just been waiting for you to allow him a voice. He's been telling you and you've been ignoring him. How have you been ignoring him? It's easy when you think you know everything. Or when you believe strongly that there is no God. I leave you with this message of love. Thank you for joining us today. Namaste, love and blessings. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Lightwolf Shamanic Healing.